Hola, comadres. Welcome to another episode of Comadreando Podcast. I am your host, Marcy, and today we're joined by an amazing guest, Geraldine, and I will let her introduce herself. Who are you? Hi, good evening, everyone. My name is Geraldine. I am a mom of two and a bonus mom of one. I am originally from New York City, and I have been um, residing in Wilmington, North Carolina for the last eight and a half years. I am a gate agent for an airline, and I work from home. I help my husband with our um, family-owned business. We have a lawn care business, and that keeps me busy along with the three kids. Awesome. Okay, um, so I usually give my uh, comadres a background of how I met my guests. And basically, one of my other comadres that is a listener um, sent me your live when you went live the other day that you were talking about, like, tips and um you know, advice for mothers that are in the process of getting their children evaluated. So, um, you know, I found that very interesting and I, you know, slid up into your DMs and I was like, would you like to be on my show? And you were like, yeah. (laughs) So um, that's how we connected. (laughs) So today's topic, kind of going in the same vein. Hold on, I'm going to have to say love you. And I'm so glad you did, that you reached out. Wait, I'm just waiting for the airplane to pass by. Okay, sorry. Okay, so today's topic is the process of initial evaluations. And the reason why the topic came up is because just like you were talking and informing other parents, I feel like my show's doing that as well. The only thing is like, you know, I want to kind of just hone in on that initial process and really um, guide parents, especially if they feel like their child is quote unquote different or is not developing at the same pace as, um, you know, typically developing children. So, um, you know, I just wanna give them more, a little bit more orientation in that area. Or, or even a sibling, you know, a lot of the times as parents, we compare our children with like, with each other or a niece and nephew or, or a neighbor or, or whatever. Or so, yeah. like Thank you. Okay. So let's start with that. What's your child's diagnosis? Um, so Gavin, he is diagnosed with autism. He is, um, he has, um, I don't have his, um, his stuff in front of me, but he has um, ADHD traits as well. So with him is not only the the emotional um, and social disconnect um, or better word, um, not being able to make um, proper connections with other people. As far as cognitively, he's very well capable of, you know, understanding um you know, as far as, you know, academics, he's able to hold a conversation um, with a child as well as an adult. Um, the only thing is that when it comes to, you know, using certain vocabulary that would express, you know, that sense of connection or or let's per se say sympathy, right? Or you're hurt or something, unless you don't make it very obvious to him, he won't know that. But he is capable of saying, mom, um, I'm not happy right now or things like that. But he won't use, you know, like I'm upset or I am, or I'm sad. Like he won't necessarily know what the word is okay, for that feeling. Um, so yeah, not yet. So, and and he is um getting services for that. So his diagnosis is pretty much um out of the four the five spectrums, he's like on the fourth one. So it's more of the of the high functioning. So um so we do predict, God willing, he will be able to you know with with guidance and with support to have a successful adulthood because he will be able to you know get a driver license and he'll be able to get a job and and things of that sort. He would just need um to continue to have that guidance so that. You know, he knows how to encounter uh, an employer, right, or or a coworker, or you know, be able to do those kind of things where he can connect and make um healthy um connections and relationships with people as he gets older. Awesome. Okay. When did you notice that your child was different? When did you notice that your child was different? I noticed that Gavin um 
he was off or something was not right when he was about a year and eight months, um, very close to his second birthday. What were the signs that you noticed that um, he was off? Because I know he's not your first baby, right? Okay. No, he's my second. He's my youngest. Um, I noticed it when um, he, he started attending daycare very early on he was about 10 months old versus my daughter she was just you know with my grandma with family so she didn't really experience the daycare preschool setting until she was like three and a half so with him he started very early 10 months old and there was like a, a report like a oh by the way today this happened um and it's, it was something that was like very frequently it was like oh he bit this kid or um he scratched this kid or um things of that nature so it was it was very a lot of like aggressive um behavior where the teachers couldn't pinpoint what was the trigger so then that raised a flag to me that didn't really happen often at home or i didn't realize it is because there's a seven year gap between my two children so you know he was never really per se like play fighting with her or anything like that so they had a really nice you know chill relationship so i didn't really notice the biting to my you know biting my daughter or biting a cousin or anything but in the school it was happening and that's when i was like hold on let me let me pay a closer look to to his behavior when he's around other kids his age so whenever he started having play dates with my nephews whenever my sisters would come down and visit um he would have a hard time. Um, they would do absolutely nothing. And he was just coming for them. He was just, and he wouldn't try to make a sound or speak or anything. It was like, he was just coming for them. Like either I'm going to bite you. I'm going to, I'm going to pull you things of that. And I couldn't figure out why, like wh why, you know, why are you, you know, in, in a sort of way, like attacking, you know, your cousin or something. So I noticed that very early on, I'll say about 10, 10 months old. And then besides the, the aggress uh, aggression, was there anything else that you noticed um in him with regards to speech or anything I did, like that or maybe I, like, I, um walking or or any anything like physical no what i did notice um that at the time i didn't felt i didn't feel that it was um concerning until i started researching it was how particular he played with toys so he would he was uh, he was obsessed with trains with thomas trains and he will line them up and they had to be so perfect like they had to be straight so he would line up the the tracks and then he will line up the um the trains like right in the center of the tracks and if for whatever reason i was to like turn them like oh look puppy they're going this way he would get so mad like he would throw the biggest tantrum ever because I moved them. So I was like, oh my God, like, why is that? And, and he started doing that with everything as well. Like he just had his way of just playing with things like, and it was like no room for doing it differently. So I, mm. that was, um, at the time it wasn't concerning. It was over time that I said, oh my God, like he's like obsessed with the way he, you know, he puts these toys or the way or where he puts it. Was at. he playing with and, them? And fast forwarding now, he actually does that too. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Say that again. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but was he playing with them appropriately? Like for example, my son at one point was flipping the cars over and just playing with the wheels and looking at how the wheel was spinning. Or, or like... No, he will play with them prop mm -hmm. appropriately. Like he would just, you know, th the right way, but they had to be like, he wouldn't let them turn. Like it had to be like straight. Like it was so weird. Like he wouldn't even, you know how the tracks can turn as long as they're connected. Mm -hmm. you can, no, it had to be straight. Like it was no room for like them curving. It had to be. And they had like little magnets at the end of each yeah, one. So it mm -hmm. lo they had to be together. Like he didn't, he didn't want them to be, on their own on like you know oh, okay you know they're they're one behind each you know one after each other but they're not connected they had to be connected and it was i mean even with the, the hot wheels the cars it lo pegaba so close that if i if i put them to the side like oh look puppy they're turning over here no it was like it, yeah it was not happening wow that's so interesting and and he so it was like, like the, the, the format of straight line that was like so like 
in his mind that and even today he he's like that Jelly. he lines up his toys like that so he will have like little um Mar- mario toys Jelly. and like um good we were he's obsessed okay, with so straight line like a little bit he has a uh, obsessive compulsive a little bit right like with the things needing to be in a certain order. Yeah. Um, I asked you if he plays with the things appropriately. You said yes, but it just needed to be in a straight line. Um, anything. It has been. And even today, like even he doesn't like the trains anymore. Like the like the figurines are also in straight line. So uh, he's going to be eight this month and he still does anything that. else that, that, that you would say is like a little bit um, not typical. Um, I would say also um, he would, like, if he was to, like, bump into something, um, he didn't, ex- like, show, he didn't display that he was hurt. Like, it was just like, como que se pegó un, <laughs> un tablazo, and he was, like, fine. And I'm like, did that hurt? Are you okay? So I don't know. I don't know what that was, but that was weird to me. I was like, any kid would have been like, ouch, or ah. Uh. And he was just, uh, okay, yeah, he he just kept him. going. My son is one. So that was concerning. Um, but I don't know if it was that I taught him kind of not to like, like cry that much when he got hurt. So like he would fall down and I'd be like, oh, you're okay, right, Poppy? And he'd be like, I'm okay. And then he like dusts himself off and just keep going. And he still does that now. But I don't know if it's because I taught him that or is that he didn't feel pain as much. But yeah, he doesn't really complain about things. Even when he's sick, he'll say his throat hurts if his throat hurts. But like not, nothing like he's not like a like like un niño muy no. Como ñoño, he's like like my son is not like that either. Like for me to know that he is actually not feeling well, I have to really ask. Like he doesn't really show it, so I don't know. I'm now I'm curious to know if they just have a high I've pain been told tolerance. That, like that they can just like, like I had a handle things, that was you know. On the spectrum and he actually, um, he had a problem with his. Was it the gall? It was like an like an internal organ issue. I want to say the gallbladder, but don't quote me on that. Anyway, he was suffering from that, and he didn't know. And he was just like, you know, and then he would like complain, like kind of, but he wouldn't like cry because I remember I took they took out my gallbladder, and I would like be hysterical, crying and like, but he wouldn't cry. And then the mom didn't know, so she took him to the doctor. Because it was like some issue with him using, um, making bowel movements or whatever. Um, mm-hmm. and, and you know what? I, I think that's true because my son in October of last year, he got his appendix removed. Y tu sabes eso duele. Like my little sister, she's 28 and she got it removed when she was like nine. Y ella tenía un dolor. Like she was crying like she was dying. So that's why I didn't know that that's what it was whenever I took him to the ER because he he normally he's a normal like he suffers from constipation like all the time. So yo pensaba that he was just backed up and he just had to go. Right. So then when he goes, Mama, no, I don't have to go. And I'm like, so why does it hurt right here? I don't know, Mama, but I don't have to go because I already tried. And I was like. And can you point on the side that it hurts you? So, el apunto en ese lado. So, I started Googling and I called my sister and said, Hey, Mariel, whenever your stuff got removed, w- what side is your scar on? Y era en el mismo lado, on the same side. So, I was like, okay. I told my husband, I said, we go going to the ER because this could be that, even though he's not complaining so severely about it. But when we got there, they did x-rays, they did everything. And they were like, oh my God, his his um, appendix is 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 very inflamed like we have to get it removed so then that's when they prepped him for procedure but he was not um complaining to the magnitude of how people complain about an appendix to be quite honest he was not it just felt like he was just constipated and he couldn't go but he told me verbally he was like mom i sat there and i i I didn't have to go but it still hurts and i was like okay when he pointed to the side i i I researched it and i was like i I made a call as a parent i was like i just have to just make sure and i'm glad that i did because he was not complaining like with tears or like bending over it wasn't even like that it was just like mom it's uncomfortable it hurts here but it wasn't like you know he didn't display it to be too bad so what what did you do when you noticed when you started noticing that he was not developing like your daughter or um did you like take him to the pediatrician or or did you 
take them to be evaluated right away? How did how did that work for you? Well, I want to be I want to keep it a hundred with you. Um, I don't know if it's a culture thing, um, you know, being Dominican, but I spoke to my mom. I called my mom and I spoke to my aunt and la do, they were like, I know me. So like, no, that's, that's nothing. El chiquito, he's still little, you know, no, you have to give him a chance to reach his milestones. You know, los niños son diferentes, they're all different. So I was like, okay. So like, it's like, como que I heard them, but then I was like, hmm. So then I, I waited a few weeks and I was like, no, something just, I guess my motherly angst. And I'm like, I just felt that, that like, that over time, it wasn't getting better. It was like the tantrums of what I called them at the time were not getting better. It was just happening more often. And he was getting older. So I'm like, it was like, no, like it should not happen. So then I finally spoke to the pediatrician and I was like, I wasn't afraid. I was like, listen, I, I am concerned. I'm not sure which route I should go. Um, and she said that um, that he was too young. At that point, he was about two. And she was like, he was too young to really... Um, she pretty much told me they tried not to do like um at least here early interventions because the the children haven't reached like certain milestones yet. Same thing my mom and my aunt told me. And yeah, they had no something something can potentially be done even if it's a tentative process, right? So um so I left it alone. I was like whatever. Then um I don't remember someone mentioned to me a program here called Smart Start. Um, they service the community, they, um, children from zero to five years old. So they have a number of services, not only for the child, but for the mother. So they have like a program where they even, they mail you books every month so they can have a nice library, you know, by the time that they reach five years old and they're actually going to start reading and all that. So a social worker, a caseworker was assigned to me and she was just, she interviewed me. She was like, you know, what are your concerns? Um, it was like a whole questionnaire about my family. And when I told her my concerns, she said, don't worry, we got you. So she actually started visiting his daycare um, at that point. So she had like a little notebook, you know, she went with her little notebook and um, I had to sign like a form where I told the daycare, you know, I am allowing her to come to the room and observe my child. So I had a little notebook and she will go about three times a week. And she would go at random times. So she wanted him to be in his element. She wanted to be at different times to kind of see, have an idea how was his day. Y si no fuera por ese, por ese notebook. If it wasn't for that notebook, I was never going to get him evaluated because they didn't feel that it was that the, the symptoms or the concerns that I felt were enough for them to go and, and proceed with a referral and, and, you know, to do like a formal evaluation. So because of that notebook, she, she observed him over a period of six weeks. Um, and I'm so happy she did that because that was my documentation. That was my, that's what I needed for them to do it. And when they read that and I read it, I was like, all that, all that is happening. And they, they only tell you like the teachers, cause I know they have other kids. They tell you just a little portion of it, but th that behavior was like happening at any little, um, area, you know, in the classroom that he went to, or God forbid he went to the playground. It was even worse, you know, because he had sensory issues sensory you know things that he didn't like especially audio like so he has sensory um, processing he's disorder. very sensitive to sound it could be a siren Got it. it could be a blender it could be if we're driving and um yo toco la bocina, like if I, if I beat the horn that was too loud um so it was it was like things that i didn't quite catch um you know on our day-to-day -day, but that lady caught those things while he was in school so if, if another child was playing with an instrument, I mean, that would annoy him. That would upset him. He would start like, you know, yelling um, or he'll go to the kid and he'll grab like the little drumstick and he'll throw it. Like all those things were documented in this notebook, which helped a lot with me figuring out why he doesn't want to touch certain things. Um, there's kids that love Play-Doh. He never liked the the the. the the texture of Play-Doh. He didn't like sand. He didn't like any of those things. So. I didn't know that because, you know, I didn't buy it for him. So I didn't know. Um, but in daycares, when they are exposed to all these different things and that notebook, that those observations that they did is really, I would say, in, in God, because that's really what drove for them to actually consider 
what I was taught, what I was telling them that was a concern. Wow, that's that's bananas. So, so the, your pediatrician just kept fighting you about it. Like, how many times did you bring it up? I brought it up on her two year old checkup, twenty four months checkup, and I brought it up when he was sixteen months. So on the year and a half checkup. So, um, the. No, the first time was when he was one and a half and then when he was two. When he was one and a half, she told me that he was too young. That get the, like he was still like kind of wobbling a little bit. So todavía he wasn't really like and he wasn't really talking much to be honest. So she was like como que it was too soon, you know, to kind of do like give me but I don't like until the next appointment and I was like okay. But the thing was that every day I was getting a call from the teachers that something else was happening. And ese niño rodó from like four different daycares like it was just hard to like you know to go to work and i'm like but something has to be wrong like and we don't know what it is so that's why when when somebody mentioned me that program i don't remember if someone mentioned it and they said just research and see if, if it's a good fit for you and it actually was when i called them it's a free service they came over they did like a little consultation they asked me a whole bunch of questions and i signed some consent forms they started going to the daycare to absorb him and they kept the notebook and i had access to the notebook um so she would photocopy the um the notebook like the pages like for that particular observation and i had record of it but then she kept it and she brought it with her because whenever we finally got fast forward to like hey i have enough enough you know data enough observations to prove that an evaluation is needed ella trajo the notebook she brought it with her and she was actually there she said do you want me to be present i said yes because you would know what to ask these people like four different people like you know testing my kid in different areas so that he was going from one area to another to another so she was there she was there the whole time and gavin already knew her because he so, had seen her in the classroom so he was comfortable so I, with this is her. interesting to me i feel like every state has a different process so they did all the evaluations for the early intervention all in one day. I mean, we said, um, we went yes, to two days. Yes, but when did you go? They didn't come to your house. No, all of these were done. Like I went to like um, what do they call it? Is is it like a center? It has like mm -hmm. multiple floors. So and the the first day was maybe like two hours, and. He went to, um, what was it? What did they do? Gross motor. They did like, they split it into two days because he was so little. So in two days, I would say the whole, total, like, I think it was like eight hours. It was like four days, four hours, one day with like a little break. And then four hours to day two. And it was four different. I think there were psychologists. I don't remember what they were, but it was four different people that were there. They gave me a breakdown of what they were doing. Um, I had to answer a series of questions um, prior to. Uh, prior to the um the date of the evaluation and that social worker that was helping me she was actually there she asked me if she wanted me to go there i'm like you you are advocating for us definitely and gavin was already comfortable seeing her because she's been to the daycare for so many weeks so they did that in, in a pro in two days they did it yeah and then it took them about four weeks to get back to me for us to meet so to discuss their findings which later I will tell you their findings. I wasn't happy with the findings. I thought it was a misdiagnosed, but yeah, <laughs> I'll save that for later. So, um, yeah. So tell me about that. Like once, once, once you, once they compiled the report that they took the four weeks to process and they met with you for that initial, um, I guess it would be an IFSP meeting. How old was he when they finally had that meeting? So when we had that meeting, um, when we got there, they were pretty much, they gave me a breakdown of um, each, I guess, each area that they were looking at. So they explained to me that um, they showed me like what was, I guess, um, what do they say? I, w I don't want to quote them wrong. Um, what was, I guess not average range i forgot what was the wording that they use but i guess where they would yeah, expect like, him to yeah. be i would say um at that at that point they, but they, i don't remember like i don't think she said average range had. i don't remember okay exactly exactly so like where ideally um developmentally yes. i guess where he should be right so they gave me those like they showed me that 
And then they show me where he was at. And um, whenever I guess they tallied up the, it didn't look good. It was like way below. Um, especially when it came to identifying feelings, I guess they showed him like photos of like faces or like, I don't, I don't know exactly what was it, but he didn't really, he wasn't able to properly connect, um, the, the emotional portions of it or the social one. Like, what will you do, you know, and, and this, like he, he didn't do that correctly. Um, and, and it could be because he was just young. I mean, who knows, but, um, so he scored very low and he, they actually, the, the final the paperwork that they gave me as far as his diagnosis for that was he had a learning disability. That's what that paper said. I was not, I did not mm. think that's what it was. I was just happy that I had something to, to hold on to so that when he started preschool, when he turned three, the school system can give him services. So I did not agree to the diagnosis, but I, I wanted to have something in my hand that said, you know, Gavin is entitled to get services, even though that was incorrectly. Because what happened was I was aware that for these IP meetings that he's now entitled to having, I can always, you know, tell the, the teacher and the team, I would like to look it over. So by me doing that, I told the teacher that when he started um, pre preschool, she said, oh, definitely. So even though he wasn't due for a meeting, she she scheduled a meeting and the diagnosis completely changed. It wasn't a learning disability because he was he was learning correctly. It was just that it was it was just something else. But they misdiagnosed him. They told me when I called them and I said, hey, doctor, I forgot what his name was. He was a psychologist. I'm like, I don't really um, believe that this is accurate. I don't think he has a, a problem with learning. I think it's something else. He said, well, we, we like to have a general, this is his words. We have, we like to have a general diagnosis because of the age. Wow. That's what he said. He didn't want to have a specific diagnosis because of the age, because he was only two, two and change. I feel like, I don't know if there's like a thing so. in the DSM five, I'm sorry that I'm stretching. Um, I don't know if there's something in the DSM five say stating that below a certain age they can't give the official diagnosis of autism because even Aiden when he first got diagnosed that he had all the evaluations and the reports um written um the diagnosis they came out with was pervasive developmental disorder not otherwise specified so basically kind of like autism yeah so it was very, very vague, vague. very um, vague. kind of like autism but um, they couldn't give an official autism diagnosis. And that's another thing that I learned. Um, you can get an autism diagnosis from a teacher. You can get it from a pediatrician. You can get it from anybody that's not a neuropsychologist. And the neuropsychologist is going to, um, to be able to get that, first of all, that is not covered by insurance. A lot of people come out of pocket for it unless you're able to get it directly through the school district. If you get it through the school district, then, um, you know, they hire a neuropsychologist and that evaluation takes about about eight hours as well. So um, what they usually do, it's like six to eight hours. What they usually do is that they schedule you and they break it up, you know, depending on how much your child can tolerate. Um, when Aiden finally had that done, he was 10. He was nine, about to be 10. He was going to graduate um, elementary school. So he had that PDD-NOS um, diagnosis on his IEP for a while. But then, you know, as they get older, to be able to qualify for certain things, certain um, certain services, they need to have like an official autism diagnosis. So it's in your best interest, especially if your child is on the spectrum, to have that on the IEP because that would um, qualify them for other services, either in school or out of school via, um, you know, Medicaid or, or, you know, any other services that you qualify for. Yeah, that, that's very similar here. That's very similar here. Um, like for him to even um, be 
for him to even be placed in the Autism Society of North Carolina's um, wait list, I ha- they had to have that official um, thing. And there's like, um, 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 what is it? Um, it's like a, a um, sports Olympics. So that organization is also one that um, provides like um, different sports services for um kids with disabilities the special no matter what it is. so it's 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 so that okay, okay. yeah uh-huh so that they can feel in, like included you know so that they can feel like they can be like if they can go in, an, in, a, in another league or another team um then they can actually have the opportunity to to experience what it is to to be uh i don't know an athlete of some sort or you know play a sport or something which is pretty neat but for all of those services if i didn't have that they would have never been able to put him on the wait list or enroll him so that that is very important for you to have that Mm -hmm. um any you know of the of those parents those parents listening because it's something that you have to have all the time to be able to properly advocate for your child and get really what your child is entitled to getting you know what i mean So a lot of the time in the school system, because I work for public schools, um, uh, I'm a special education teacher. So when I get um, an IEP from a student, I know the kids on the spectrum because I know the behaviors and I've been working with kids with um, autism or whatever other disability for a very, very long time. Right. But a lot of the time when I pick up the IEP, what does it say? Speech delay. Okay. And in the schools, unless you have a specific diagnosis of, you know, a certain um, disability, you don't qualify for other for other things. So a lot of these kids are just getting speech. They're not getting occupational therapy. They're not getting psychotherapy, um, psych, um, counseling. They're not getting all these other services that would pertain to them because of the diagnosis, you know, and the behaviors. So I feel like you know, for the comadres that are listening that have kids with um, special needs, look over the IEP and look at that classification. It's right on the first page and it'll tell you, you know, speech delay is not accurate. Like you need your kid to have an accurate um, diagnosis on the IEP. And if you need to call a meeting, call that meeting and get an advocate to sit with you. And also um, you can bring it up to your um, pediatrician as well. They can help you with that. Um, another thing I did was I got a developmental pediatrician for Aiden. Um, he has a regular one and then a developmental one. The developmental one is more helpful with um, those kind of referral letter, letters and things like that. So they, they're pretty knowledgeable with respect to, you know, what to expect and, and how you can help your child. And also they know a lot of um, resources for you as well. I don't know if you want to add something to that, Geraldine. Well, I'm mm-hmm. glad you mentioned that. I, I'm glad you mentioned that because I wasn't even aware about that developmental pediatrician, to be honest. I I honestly feel that, and it could be where I'm located. It, this could vary by state. Um, I feel like a lot of the services pertaining to his diagnosis, um, I've, I figured out on my own. Like I did the legwork for it. Um, and, and I don't know if that's the same, you know, anywhere else where, you know, any of the listeners are are listening (laughs) from, but I do feel that even if, I I mean, I feel like, like I always say, we are our children's biggest advocates. Like it doesn't matter how, how good of a doctor you have. And, and, and I mean, for the most part, um, Gavin has had great doctors. Um, but I feel like a lot of the, <clears throat> excuse me, the resources that I found, I've done the legwork for. And I just want to let any of the listeners know, just be prepared to, to do the legwork for your kid. And, and, um, and don't be afraid to challenge your doctor, um, their doctor, like ask questions. A good doctor would, if they don't have the answer, because the medical field is something that it's always evolving, it's always changing. Um, they could tell you, hey, you know, I'm going to have my nurse call you back with this. You know, let, let me research it up or let me get myself updated with whatever it might be. You know what I'm saying? So don't be afraid of doing that because a good doctor will either give you the answer 
or if they don't have it, they'll find you the answer. Um, so that's just a suggestion that I have. And, 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 and just don't, don't give up. Don't settle with a diagnosis. Um, if, if I would have settled for that original evaluation, um, findings, he would have not been getting the proper services right now. And, and the, and by me not listening to my mom, to my aunt, to my, to the doctor. And I, I mean, just kind of like keep digging, keep digging because the longer you wait, it's valuable time that your child is missing out on services that can, that can make a difference. Yeah. I want to, I want to chime in on that. So like the, the, the longer you wait, the bigger the gap, right? So let's say your child, uh, when you first start noticing a delay, you notice that it's, it might be like three months, right? The more time you wait, the bigger the gap gets. And the same thing goes for reading and um, speech development. You know, that time doesn't help. It just makes it worse, right? So the faster you get the help, the better it is for your child in the long run. Um, my best friend who passed, um, her daughter, uh, got evaluated when she was a child and, um, she got evaluated with like, um, hyper, hyperactivity, right? So she got evaluated and eventually they dropped the IP because what they found is that she wasn't being challenged enough in school. So once she got into the gifted program, she her behavior completely changed and she was being challenged, right? So an IEP is not like a death sentence. It's not something that's gonna stay there forever. If you get your child help early enough and you figure out what it is that they need, it's gonna be easier for them to make those strides to get closer to their typically developing peers. And also to get help to, you know, learn coping skills. I wanted to ask you about your son's behavior. Like what was it that they did to help him with the aggression that he was um, demonstrating in school? Um, so he had like different fidgeting elements. So <clears throat> he had things that, um, that will stimulate him. I don't really remember when he was three, but now what they do is, um, the school that he's in now, they have an area in their cafeteria. Um, they call it the cool zone. So if you're getting upset to the point where you might want to grab something or throw it or something, anything of that sort or yell or whatever, they have it in the corner. They have it closed in like a little, um, like a little corner. They have like one of those stand up trampolines. They have this little like rock looking kind of thing to climb over. And they have this like rope, like pulling things. So that would like at least physically and mentally help the child kind of like cool off. I guess that's the name why they call it cool zone. Um, and that has been so, so great. Um, whenever Gavin got upset because he wasn't first at doing something. Um, he likes a lot of like leadership things. Like I want to be the hand sanitizer helper. So when everybody walks in, I, I give them a squirt of the sanitizer. Like he want, he, he wanted those leadership kind of roles where he was, you know, do, doing things, you know, he was assigned things to help everybody else. So whenever that didn't happen, he would get upset. So then it was like, okay, Gavin, you cannot always be first. Or whenever he got out of the, the 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 van for after school, you cannot always be first. So things like that will like trigger him and get him upset, you know, because in his mind, if for the last couple of days I've been first, if I'm not first today, like that's not how it goes. Like I'm sitting in this row, so I should go next. So um, things like that, like I, I'm stepping out of routine for him is um, chaotic, is very bad. Even for us, even planning a vacation, we cannot give him, um, you know, like my 14 year old, I'm like, okay, mommy, in two weeks, we're going to Florida. We're going to, to, you know, to DR or whatever. And they, she understands that. And my stepson, he's eight. He understands that. Gavin has no concept of time. So he will literally ask you for the next two weeks, when are we leaving? When are we leaving? So it's something that will constantly, you know, come up. Um, so the way that I've actually learned to introduce this concept of time, whenever we're giving him like a heads up, like, Hey, you know, on Saturday, we're going to the movies. Right. I would say, he would say, Oh mama, when is Saturday? <clears throat> and I will say, well, Saturday, um, it'll be four good nights from today. 
So that means you have to go to sleep and wake up four times for it to be Saturday. So then he goes, oh, okay. Okay. So tomorrow will be three good nights. And then it'll be, and then that's how he's slowly grasping, you know, somewhat the concept of time because he has no concept of time at all. <clears throat> so, um, so yeah, so that, you know. Yeah. It's like a learning process too. Like I might have to figure out another way of explaining it once he hits ten or uh, eleven. Is he getting counseling at school right now or no? No. So right now he's getting um he's getting a little bit of speech just because his stuttering has gotten worse over time. Um, but that doesn't stop him though. Um his friends don't really make it a point. Like I I was praying that the the kids won't be like um like, like, come on, hurry up, Gavin. Like, what are you saying? Like, they're very patient. Um, so they're they don't rush him or anything. Even though at times I'm like, Papi, like, what are you trying to tell me? Because it would like a, I don't know, a five word sentence, he will stutter through like four of them. <clears throat> so um, so he's getting a little bit of that. It's getting better now. Um, he's getting um that emotional support. He he's getting a transition support. So he has an adult for every Every transition throughout his day, like if he has music, he has gym, he has whatever, that adult is transitioning to him because he has a very hard time. Um, even though they tell him, like, look, in this amount of minutes, we're gonna go and move on to do this, he doesn't he doesn't get it. So that adult is kind of prepping him, like, okay, Gavin, we're gonna clean up in like, you know, two minutes. Um, we're gonna clean up our toys or I mean our so our notebooks or whatever, and we're gonna go to like recess, or we're gonna go to have lunch. So every single transition of his day, he has an adult or what they will call a para in, in, in New York or something. So that adult is there with him most of the day because every transition and until he's fully like settled and ready for whatever they're doing, then that adult moves on to like a next kid or something like that. So he gets that, <clears throat> which was just added to his IEP back in January after um, Christmas break. And that has made a big difference. That like the whining and complaining about that I wasn't ready to do this or to move on to this because he would say, well, I wasn't finished doing that. Oh, I wasn't like things like that, he would say. Um, and now having this adult or para with him for every transition, like I will say the the outburst um, have minimized like like 99%. Have they have they considered <laughs> using like visual schedules for him? Yes, they okay. added that in January. And he does very good. He has like a, they call it a progress chart, but mm -hmm. it's a really a behavior chart. And the, his goals are like listed, like mm -hmm. what goals we want for the day. Like maybe um, having him complete his tasks with with minimum redirection or um, um, it's like four different um, four ta four um, goals that he has like every day for each for each um, part of the day. And he gets like a little star for each one. So the, the, everything adds up to like 40 stars. And every day he sees this visual, like in, in, in reading, we did this. In math, we did this. And, um, you know, social, um, what do they call it? Social skills. I have that. So he will come home with his folder like, mama, look, I have 40 stars. I, I have all my stars. I'm like, good job. So, um, so he will say, mama. Miss Blackley only told me one time and I did it one time. And I'm like, excellent. That's great. So that has helped um, that behavior chart sort of speak for me to, to know, you know, how he did. But for him to know also, look, this is how you're doing. And um, he has like a larger one in, in class where um, I don't know how they kind of like warn him, like, look, we're going to the next thing. But he's able to put his finger on, oh, we're doing this now. We're, after we finish here, we're going to do this. So he knows exactly what's going to happen. And that has worked great because when he didn't know what he was getting into later, it was like, but why? I'm not finished. Oh, that's so boring. I don't know how to do that. I don't want to do Like he will come up with like a whole bunch of reasons why he was not ready to move on mm. to the next thing. And now that he can see it is like, listen, we don't, really have a choice for this because we have to learn this we have to do this but you know we're giving you like enough time for mm -hmm. us to prepare ourselves you know if you have to go to the bathroom if you have to get a, a break of water you know a drink of water or anything like that and that has helped from january to now it's helped tremendously okay. like 
I'm telling you, like, it's mind blowing how him having access to his schedule yeah. per se, um, will be able to see it. Is he in? Is, is, is um? So here in New York, I don't. You, I think I remember from the live. You have a, a sister in law that is a teacher, or. Well, no, my sister. She's yeah. a, she's a teacher so, in New York. Okay, what setting is he in, in in school? Like, what what kind of classroom setting? Is he like in a smaller setting, or is he with like typically developing peers, and he has an IP, or is he in a, like an ICT, which is a combined classroom? So the way it is. So the way that the way that because this school, um, Smipes Academy, is a school where, um. I think it's 89% of the population of the children there have uh, a, a special need of some sort. And it varies from like, some of them are physical, some of them are cognitively, you know, it varies. So they do have general ed students there. However, the classroom, the way their ratio set up, I think is about, I think it's 19, if I'm not mistaken, about 19 or 20 kids. However, the way his schedule is is broken down, he's not in that classroom the whole time. So he meets the special education teacher that's assigned to him and like six other kids. I think she has like one to six or something like that, one to five, something like that. So he will go, when I drop off, he'll go to her classroom. He leaves his stuff there. Um, he gets his like morning check-in. She asks him, how are you feeling? How's, you know, how are you, Gavin? Whatever. She'll have his, like his little visual chart ready. And after that, that's like a, I think like a 15 minute thing. He walks up to his classroom in the, in the next floor where his general ed teacher has like, I don't know, it's not circle time. It's like, um, what do they call it? Like greetings, Morning like, meeting. oh, today's Wednesday, you know, how's the weather, that kind of thing. Morning meeting. Yeah, there you go. So they will do that together because they say it's important for him, you know, socially to be able to have that part of the day with his peers because he could benefit from it, from the social skills. So he will do that there. Then... He would do like the core things, like the like math, writing, and the the phonics, the reading, whatever. That he will come back down to, um, to the special ed teacher, where she's actually doing pretty much the same thing that the general ed teacher is doing. Like they, she piggybacks on it. She gives it to her. Like, look, this is what we're doing today, and that's what he does with her. So he is in the general ed classroom like that's his homeroom but he's not there the whole day so he's 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 split into like that he he's in either one or two places so either the special ed teachers classroom or the general mm, ed teacher. okay for testing and stuff like that he does like his little like when they want to do testings for him that they do like online with their um to kind of see you know where he, like where he's at or whatever that's always done in the special ed classroom um and then Whenever is something where um, I guess when they're not introducing something different, then he goes to the general ed because they also they want to be because I wanted him to be inclusive. Like I'm like, I, I want you to pull him out to to support him with what he needs. But if you feel that he's OK with doing it with the general ed, just have him, like, don't restrain him from, you know, being integrated. You know what I mean? So that's what they've been doing. So, you know he's involved everything's different um if, uh, in new york we have a integrated co-teaching um classroom so basically the special education teacher and the general ed are in one classroom together they both pull their groups of children right um there's kids with ieps and there's kids that are typically developing so the way that we used to do it is we're teaching the same lesson she's on her side of the room with her group of kids and i'm on my side of the room with my group of kids and then I'm provo providing supports, same lesson, providing supports, and also, um, what is it, um, modifying the curriculum so that it's attainable to them. And they're learning the same exact skills, but at, you know, in a way that they're going to understand it, right? And then it wasn't... So to meet their exactly. needs. So it wasn't always that I was always with the kids, only with the kids with special needs. There was kids in my group that were not performing like the the rest of the kids that were closer to grade level and they did not have an IEP, but because I was already teaching with modifications, they would be in my group. Um, yeah. So they, they still had the social thing. Like we would participate the ICC class 
literally was with everybody all the time um and is less restrictive but um yeah that's that, that's an interesting um so the, so so that's kind of what they're doing yeah, but they're in two separate they classrooms. Have them in two, that's pretty much what they're doing is they, it because of covid like they, they, they have them in two separate classrooms they gave her the lesson I don't think so. I think because the way it's set up is like I don't really think they can fit it anymore. It's a lot of kids there. in the classroom, but I but because the thing with the what, what the special ed teacher with her classroom, like the kids that she has are not only from Gavin's homeroom. So there's like another second grade oh. class kids that is also that are there. So I don't know if it's to kind of like have her service more than one second grade class or, or something. I don't know. So I don't know if, 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 I don't know the reasoning behind it, but it's not, it's not because of COVID. It, it's always been that way where they have um, the special ed teacher just have that group. And they actually piggyback from what the general ed teacher is already teaching. So it's kind of like similar, like you guys were in two, it's the same thing, same lesson. It's just done, you know, to accommodate, you know, the needs of those. Of That's those interesting. Kids. All right. So tell me more about Gavin. Um, what is, who is he? What makes him sparkle? Like, what are things that he's into? Tell me more about him. I know he's not into um, trains anymore. What is it? He's into. <laughs> oh my Gavin! So he is. He, I would say he's a very, he's a very animated kid. Um, he is the type of kid that he will watch true story uh the skittles commercials and he will like modify his voice like skittles taste the rainbow like he will like it and he does that with thing. like movie trailers it is the same thing oh my god mm -hmm. he changes this, his voice to match like with that sonic movie he's obsessed like the trailer was about two minutes long and i tell you that juro por dios he memorized the entire trailer and he changed the pitch of his voice to match the character on the trailer. And to me, that's a gift. Like, he memorized it. Uh, they have he a feature in the voice pitch acting, of the voice. Because seriously, that's hard for me. That's what I said. You know, but it's crazy. Like, that's awesome. What else is he into? <laughs> That's to me that's mind blowing. So um so he's into that. Um he he um he likes Sonic, he likes Mario Bros. He likes um he now just got a, a Nintendo Switch in December. I was kind of prolonging it. I was like, oh whatever. But he likes um aviation. I don't know because I'm in that industry and because we travel a lot, but he says he wants to he wants to be a pilot. So um, I'm excited for that. Um, he um, there are a lot of games on the Switch that will stimulate like him like driving a plane. So my mom like he doesn't know, but my mom got him a, a game for that. Um, he likes um, <clears throat> when he watches YouTube. It's so funny. He would watch a kid playing with a toy, but he has that toy, but he's watching the kid play with the toy. So he will say, mommy, can you buy me this toy? And I'll buy it for him and I'll get it for him. And he would just watch the YouTube video of the kid playing with the toy. And I'm like, Gavin, you don't want to play with it? He's like, wait, mama, I'm watching such and such. And I'm like, not only kids on the spectrum, because my friend's okay. kids like watching other kids play with toys. And they're not on the spectrum. I'm just like, it's like a new phenomenon. That and oh then like God. that and the slime videos, like watching other kids play with slime. Like that's a thing. And as a teacher, I'm just like, that is so weird. Not weird in a bad way, just interesting. I'm just like, hmm. Not weird in a bad way. I'm like, look at that. Like, what, what, what do you, what's so it's because, you know, motivating about watching that? I don't know. Fascinating, right? And, and, and to me, it's like, you know, you know, I get at first, you know, you have your child watch the video. The, the kid is like rating the toy. Like, oh, I, it's fun or is this. Okay, mom and dad going to go buy me one. So I would think. Once your mom or dad purchases that toy, it's like you're done with the video. But he continuously watches it, and I'm like, "But you have the toy already." So, um, so yeah, so that's interesting. That's something that's very peculiar. I guess it's not just him, but you know, um, he um, what makes him stand out is how animated he is. He is, um, like he's like the life of the of anywhere he goes to. Like he would say things that people some people would take it as either rude or like um 
or I don't, I don't even know how to explain it, but he's it's very just, honest. He's so direct. He doesn't have. Yes, he's so direct. He's so honest. However, if he's made aware that he hurt your feelings, oh my God, he's so remorseful. He will say, "Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, I'm sorry about that. You know, I, you know, I didn't mean that." Um, like a recent true story. Um, one of his um paras was like, "Oh, Gavin, <clears throat> you didn't give me a hug today." Oh yeah. So she was like, "Oh, Gavin, you know, I'm sad." You know, I really missed you, you know, during spring break and you didn't give me a hug. And he pretty much said, I don't want to quote it because the way she said it, I was just like laughing internally. He pretty much said, you know, for spring break, I was, you know, seeing my grandma and my and my aunt and my cousins. And I and then like I, I wasn't thinking like I, don't, I didn't remember you until I came back to school, in other words. So that sounded so harsh. So she said, I mean, but it was the truth. I mean, he was not thinking about school. He was not looking forward to going back to school. And, you know, he was not thinking about it. He was like, oh, I wasn't thinking about, about you, you know, on my spring break. She was like, oh, my God, Gavin. And then she said, that hurts my feelings. And then he was like, oh, I'm sorry, um, Ms. Lee. I didn't, I didn't mean for you to be sad. But I want to give you a hug now. And then he hugged her. So those are the things that you have to really like know the child and, and see where they're coming from. Because any, any of us would have probably sugarcoated that, right? And said, oh, yeah, I miss you too, or whatever. But he said, I wasn't really thinking about anybody from school, really. You know, when I was on spring break and he told her. He's saying, well, doing. actually, and then when she I didn't told know him, nobody from the school. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Gavin's me. Exactly. <laughs> but 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 after she made him after she made him like think about it like like I I mean I, I feel sad because I really miss you and I wanted a hug. He was like, Oh, I, I wanna give you a hug now. Like I love you. Like, you know, so so that was that was very interesting um for her to tell me that and, and it's so typical of him. Um with him, um he typically has to initiate affection, um, even if it's like hugging or like kissing. I'm a very affectionate mom um, with my with my oldest. Um, even now she's 14. A lot of teenagers don't really want their moms to kiss and hug them. And she she comes and she hugs me. I mean, but with Gavin, I had to learn that. It no le gusta like all that, like hugging and, you know, como que la, como la ñoñería. like he doesn't like that. If he wants a hug, you come and you feel I'm like, oh, okay, Gavin. Like and he starts like like rubbing against me, like hugging me, and like and I was like, oh, okay, puppy. He was like, Mama, I would like a kiss. So he would say that, and then I'll give him a kiss. Um, it was hard for me to to accept that, you know, that I can't just go randomly and kiss my child because my child might not want to be kissed at that time, and that was hard. You know, that was hard pill to swallow for me. Um, as a parent, you want to have the liberty to to show affection to your kid. Um, I verbally tell him all the time, either he wants to hear it or not. I, I say it and he will say it, but he's like, I love you too, mama. But when it comes to hugging and like touching, be showing affection that way, I let him initiate it because he has not expressed that he liked that, um, a, a lot of times in the past. So, um, that's one of the things that I've, I've had to kind of like learn. Um, I don't like it, but I mean, I have to, it's, it, it's whatever's best for him. Um. I know eventually he will grow to show um, affection in a healthy way or whatever that might mean for him. Um, but by him being vocal about he doesn't want to be hugged or, or, or kissed or whatever, that's fine. You know, I love I think that. Every, everybody should be that. I love that. Because I teach my students consent that way, especially in the special education classrooms. Because the thing is, you know, when they're little, they're so cute and you don't mind if they hug you all the time. But then they start getting bigger. They're not, <clears throat> sorry, they're not conscious of their own bodies and they're growing. And at one point they're going to get taller than me or they're going to get to the point that they're like up to my boobs, like, you know, and they're not aware of that. So just like kind of teaching them, hey, you know, sometimes people don't want hugs and that's okay. You know, um, yeah, like I have, I have fifth graders that are taller than me right now and like, I just eat. I'm teaching them consent. I'm like, you know, sometimes I don't want to be hugged. 
and I still love you the same. And, and that could be with their peers as well. And it could yeah, be their so peers too. I'm teaching it in my classroom like, in that hey, way, you know what I'm saying? Know? But then I'm like, you know, everybody else is like that too. Sometimes people want physical affection and sometimes they don't. You need to ask. And if somebody says no, that's okay. You know, that is their body. This is my body. That's your body. You know, like you control what happens with your body. They control what happens with their body. And 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 I feel like a lot of people, like when we grew, I know we're in, you're in your 20s, 30s, right? Mid-30s. Mid All right, it's fine. I'm in my late 30s. Um, <laughs> when we grew up, they would guilt trip us about now saludando de que con beso del mundo, Right? They'd be like, exactly. Exactly. Esa sí yeah. es, que sí, okay. No saluda a nadie de esto. Sí es seca. No, es seca. why are you forcing little kids to kiss grown men? No. Period. Or anybody at no. all. You can say hello, and that's, that's polite. You know, hi. Buena tarde, buena noche, you know, yeah. Yeah, I agree. But it, it was still hard oh, for no, me yeah, as a, as a parent, parent to not hard. have that like, liberty. wasn't like that like, when he was, you know. he was like Gavin when he was little. He did not like to be hugged or squeezed or anything like that. He would resist. But then I feel like I loved him now. Now he like randomly comes and sniffs me and hugs me and like smells my chichos. He's that kind of affectionate. But he initiates it. Like, yo no lo puedo. I'll ask him. I'm like, well, that's how I'm like, dame un beso. He'll and he's come like, randomly. Okay. Like, and then he'll come. But he, he, he like, yeah. he's, I'm like, do you want to give me a kiss? He's like, no. I'm like, okay. <laughs> I was like, let me just go cry. Yeah, Gavin is very similar, but it's I don't know. Is is your son? My Gavin is so attentive to yeah. detail. Like, if he literally, like, not even my husband notices this. Like, whenever I go get my nails done, he the color, well, Mama, that's a nice color on you. I'm like, oh, thank he's you, not so pendiente. Like, stuff he like notices that. everything. I'll ask my him. eyebrows. I'll ask him. I'm like, puppy. Like, do you like mommy's ass? Ooh, mommy, yes. I like your nails. He won't know. I mean, he'll notice. Like, I feel like randomly he'll notice things. Like, the other day, I, I, it was funny. I posted a TikTok about it. I was wearing a Game of Thrones shirt, and it has, like, all the house crests or whatever. And I'm, he, I wear the shirt all the time. And I guess he, like, noticed it that day. He's like, wow, I like that shirt. Mommy, can I have your shirt? I'm like, what? And so I took it off and I gave it to him. And I'm like, I guess he could keep it. Like, it fits him now. But it was just so random. Like, he doesn't notice, like, everything all the time. Like, this is not the first time I wear yeah, this, you know? Like, this is not my first time wearing I have wearing a tattoo this, you know? of, um, it's another nerd tattoo. So I have a tattoo of, um, I don't know if you know Lord of the Rings. There was, like, a tree on a, on a thing. I got the tree and it has Elvish around it in writing. He's like... Wow, mommy, randomly one day I'm wearing like a tank top. Wow, mommy, I really love your tattoo with the tree. I was like, I'm like, it's a huge. Nick and me, that's been there forever. <laughs> well, it's funny, but okay, he gets so surprised. Uh, so, uh, oh my God. And if he knows you and you get hurt, or like you have surgery or something, you remember that forever. My mom had um a surgery um for her arm because she tore her rotator cuff, and randomly he'll be like chilling in the house in my mom's house, and he'll be like, "Grandma, is your arm okay?" Like looking very concerned, and he'll touch her very gently on the on the shoulder, like, "Is your arm okay?" Mind you, she's not complaining about it, but como que se le ocurre de repente. Like, you remember that, como like, como all of a sudden. that's in his mind. Like, I know something mm -hmm. happened. Yeah, like, I remember, Grandma, something happened to your arm, so I want to make so sure cute. that you oh. They're so sweet, yeah, the... <sighs> Vamos a cambiar un ching de tema. Let's, let's switch a little bit. Let's switch gears a little bit. Um, So, what are some of your fears or reservations as a parent of a child who will one day be a young man with autism as he gets older and becomes an adult? Sorry. Everybody, every time I ask this question, everybody gets super serious. My, um, my, my main concern has been um, him. Well, I, I have, I have a couple. The, the, I will say the primary one is 
him being able to be self-sufficient as an adult while I'm no longer living. That's my main thing. Like I want him to really be able to take care of himself when I'm no longer here. And, and God knows as long as I'm living, it doesn't matter if he moves out, he's in another state, I'm going to make sure that he's going to be okay. Um, as a parent, that's what we want to make sure our kids are okay, even if they move out. But another thing is with how his aggression was before, um, all I thought was Dios libramelo, like from having an outburst with someone outside that can get him in some sort of trouble or like going off on his boss and getting fired or something like things like that, where, you know, him like flipping out or not expressing himself the right way as an adult that can get you in trouble. Um, that could that could jeopardize your freedom that can jeopardize how close you're allowed to be to someone um and things of that nature so that's something it might sound like extremist or an extreme but it's 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 my concerns that since i've seen him grow up and having episodes of biting kids and hitting and pulling and yelling and looking so upset i was like i do not want my child to become a grown man expressing himself this way and, and and being like this because that's just that's just trouble and and that's that's my concern but i know that other than that he's going to thrive he's smart he's loving um i'm going to do everything in my power to continue to get him services so that he can be self sufficient but just that part of him being able to properly deal with situations under stress um he had an incident which is why the concern hasn't gone away um where um the teacher asked him to um i guess to give personal space to one of his friends that he's very cool with i I, i'm i think it's safe to think that they're probably best friends because they always play together um and um the teacher said you know gavin give major some personal space um but why that's my friend like he just went and they were going from the playground to the classroom. He had his water bottle. He threw the water bottle. I'm like, oh my God. El tiro la, el agua. El hizo un reguero de agua. El estaba diciendo que I hate it here. I, I, I want to go home. Um, You don't let me play with my friend. Like, el se puso, like, to the extreme. And all she said was, Gavin, move back a little bit. Give him some space. And he went off. Um, And the way that they told me that he was acting and that he told me by his words because he was remorseful after he he apologized but he was acting so like the outburst was so like over the top that i was like once again i do not want my child to become an adult reacting this way or someone maybe saying how to follow rules or or setting boundaries for him or whatever it is like it should not be this way and I was like, as an adult, this can cause you a lot of problems. This could be, you know, jeopardizing your freedom, jeopardizing how close you can be to someone, um, and so many other things. So that's that's my major, my major wow. concern. Um, I know it's so scary too, because it's like, you know, we want to be there all the time for them and and things like that, like, like, like we, we literally like worry ourselves sick about things like that because we don't know what the, what the future holds and, and, and it makes us. Or, or God forbid, Marcy, even thinking about something simple like an episode, maybe driving like road rage. What is road rage going to look for him? How is he going to deal with, you know, you know what I mean? Like, Things like that are concerning to me. Like, you know, the way he reacts to things is a little in the I, extreme. I want to ask you, is he on medication right now? Not for not for the aggression, but d- did they put him on any kind of medication for Certainly anything? Because no. mm. no. Aiden was having um, violent outbursts like that when he was taking... He was taking um, Adderall. He was taking for... Because he has... ADHD, but it's more attention, right? Um, so when he was taking that, I was noticing more um, outbursts, like aggression towards other people. But the thing with him, I started noticing what it was. The medicine wasn't letting him be hungry, right? And Aiden's the type of kid that si no come, se pone de mal humor. 
de un, a un punto, he gets to, in bad mood in a way that he does not listen, he does not think, he just reacts, right? So for me, I started noticing that, and then I started researching the effects of that particular medication. I don't think it was Adderall necessarily that name brand, whatever. It wasn't necessarily that name brand, a, a whatever the generic, you know, thing was for that medication. But I noticed once I stopped giving it to him, the outburst stopped. So, you know, it has to be something with the chemistry of his brain that when he takes that medication was affecting his behavior. So, you know, we're looking for something else now with the doctor. You, you know what? You're, you're, you're making me think maybe it could be something in his diet because he's not on medication. So maybe I'm giving him something that it's trigger. You know what? Now I have some homework. Yeah, it's, o- it's always good. Yeah, maybe um, think about that. Like it could be, it could be something in his it's diet. It's always good to check because um, a lot of people, and you said he suffers from constipation. Okay. Chronic so, constipation. Definitely look at his diet because the thing is also, I, 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 this is another thing. I did like a lot of research about like naturalistic medicine and how to feed your child to quote unquote cure autism, which is there's no cure, people. I hear that and it makes me cringe. It makes me upset to my bones. Yes, you can, you know, lessen the symptoms, but it's not a disease and it's not curable. Your child is autistic. Whether the, the, you know, the symptoms are more pronounced, it all depends on diet, um, you know, behavior, therapies, all those things, right? You know, there's no magical wand. And also, just like Geraldine was saying, there can be a misdiagnosis, right? They can say your child, quote unquote, is autistic, and they might not be because it might have been that your child was demonstrating certain behaviors and then later on, might have those behaviors might have gone away you know so going back to the the point is like you know it's always good to research guys like like geraldine says challenge your doctor do your own research like don't accept it as you know bible like question things if if anything if anything i like if anything that i'm doing in the show i would love for you to really question everything literally everything even the things that I'm saying, look it up, <laughs> check it out for yourself. Look for it, do research, and that's another thing. Like, I really agree with what you, what you said. You have to do your own research, and you're gonna have to do the legwork, you know, to see what works for your child or what does not work for your child, you know. And and every person with autism is different. Everybody's organism is different, you know. So what works for one person might not work for the other person. And some things do work, and some things don't, and that's okay. Yep. You know, and because with- everybody's unique in, in, in their in their own way, because you can have two children with the same exact diagnosis, but the way they're going to they're going to be um, um, the way they're going to be um, serviced to help them could be completely different. The way that is going to be approached, it could be different because of their environment, their home life, um, the, their nutrition, though, I mean, Everything is going to be um, a factor to make it unique, even though the diagnosis could be similar. Um, it could be a lot of people have like um, they're under the Asperger, right? Which is kind of a little bit. I think whenever we go back to to, to um, go over Gavin's, I'm very inclined to that one because of uh, some of the things that I found that I research. But I don't like to self-diagnose my kids. I like to kind of like let people, you know, professionals do their thing. But um you can have two two individuals with the same per se diagnosis um or similar and you might not be able to offer the same services to this one to the that you do to the other because they're just unique it's not something like for example you have somebody that suffers from diabetes for example right and okay what type is it okay you're going to prescribe them this this you know this dosage of whatever medication and that might work for what about 150 patients let's say right um that have similar backgrounds similar eating styles you know that they're somewhat similar but when it comes to an 
autism diagnosis. It doesn't work that way. You can't really like put it in this box. Like, okay, so everyone that has this autism diagnosis is going to get these services and this amount of time, this amount of minutes. And this, like, it, it doesn't work that way. It's just such a unique um, condition that it's, it's just, it's just different. So don't, don't try as a, as a parent or as an aunt or uncle or grandparent to compare, um, you know, your, your child, um, with other children, because as it is, we're all different as it is. So now with this, um, specific, um, condition, it makes them even more unique. So, um, so you're not really going to fit them into any, you know, box, you know, per se. So, um, so that's something to kind of think about to not, um, and, and, and I've encountered parents that are in some sort of denial or some, not denial, but they're like afraid of searching for help. They can see certain red flags, but they're afraid of labeling their kid. And that is actually stopping them from getting yeah. proper help to get it. That's going to be the topic. For and, and, and that's such a disadvantage. That's going to be the topic for another episode. Like, um, what is it? Not prejudices, but um, taboos with respect to uh, diagnoses. Bueno, comadres, uh, we're already over time. <laughs> and um, with that, I'm going to end the episode how I always do. Follow me at Comadre and the Pod on Instagram and follow Geraldine at jeras underscore tlc okay. and if you have any questions at all for me or geraldine feel free to send me a comadregram at comadreando at esc the network.com or slide up into my dms and i want to thank you all for spending the afternoon and evening with your comadres bye thank you for having me bye guys